All right. Um, so before I start off, I got to say one thing. I come to this a lot. I yell a lot. So I most definitely deserve the same. So just, just wreck my shit, fam. I know what's coming. All right, with that out of the way, I got to start with some bad news. Did you know that people on the internet tell lies? I know, I know. <laughs> or like someone writes a memoir and I'm crying like, oh, his life is a million little pieces. And then he's on Oprah, whoop, and the gift's gonna play, or maybe it won't, oh, it does, great. Um, and he's famous, and next thing you know, it's all fake. But I mean, he wrote a whole book. It got published. It had to go through editors and like a whole fucking process. If someone goes through all that work to build an elaborate lie and countless details to support that lie, it feels easier to accept. So we're gonna talk about someone who created a fake origin story and then a deeply detailed world to support that lie. George Salmanazar. Now, as best as we can tell, uh, he was born between 1679 and 1684. Then the main period of time we're going to talk about is 1703. Um, again, as best as we can tell, he was originally from southern France, but this was never formally confirmed. They believe he was French based on his accent when he spoke Latin. <laughs> then as far as his real name, yeah, we got no fucking clue. Um, <laughs> George Salmanazar is a name he developed as part of his fake identity. He never revealed his real name. His memoirs, published after his death, are even titled Memoirs of... <laughs> uh, commonly known by the name of George Salmanazar, which... Rude. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> anyway, I want to focus, focus on what George Salmanazar is most famous for, his claim to be a native of the island of Formosa. <laughs> Wait, wait, sorry, yeah, that, that's Formosa. So, um, this is a map Salmanazar drew of his native land. Um, you can see China on the left, part of Japan in the upper right, then Formosa is in that island chain, which is a little awkward because Formosa, that island chain, that island chain does not exist. Um, so, I know, right? Um, so within that chain, it's still a little hard to see, so we can zoom in and it's right there. Now, Formosa, for those of you that don't know, is a real, hey, uh, it's a real place. It's known as Taiwan. Now, at the time, Taiwan was known as Formosa instead of Taiwan. It is a place that people had heard of. The Dutch East India Company and the British both had presences on the island uh, sometime in prior to this point in time. So, one thing to keep in mind as we discuss Salmanazar's version of Formosa is that despite the lurid land that he concocts, out there is a real place with real people and histories. For expedience sake, for expediency's sake, I'm going to keep referring to Salmanazar's hoax as Formosa, but please do not confuse anything I am about to say with the real Taiwan. And as you'll come to find out, Salmanazar's version is definitely more like Taiwan. Hey. <laughs> All right, so we're going to skip past the whole developing the hoax part and jump to when Salmanazar arrives in London in 1703. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, <laughs> at this point, he's worked with a Scotsman to um, go from pretending to be a Japanese heathen um, and instead a native of Formosa that was kidnapped by Jesuits. And that's how he got to Europe. Uh, which played great in England since they were not fans of the Jesuits there. So, <laughs> uh, Salmanazar hits London and he is the talk of the town. Everyone wants to meet him. They want him to teach his language at Oxford. People are clamoring to hear all the stories of this mysterious land. But of course, not everyone was convinced. Uh, one notable naysayer was Edmund Haley, a famous astronomer. Who of you have heard of Haley's Comet? You've heard of him. One time, <laughs> uh, Salmanazar appears at the Royal Society and Haley has a famous exchange where he asks how long the sun shines down the chimneys each day. Now, he asks this so that he can go back, do some calculations and a little bit of science uh, yeah. hey, um, to prove that Salmanazar is a fake. But Salmanazar is quick on his feet. Salmanazar is like, oh, dude, 
great question, but like super awkward. The chimneys in, some, in Formosa are bent. Sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> so this is also a good time to pause um, and bring up one question that didn't come up specifically at the Royal Society, but you may be wondering about. Salmanazar's French. He's white, he's blonde, and he looks nothing like you would expect someone from Taiwan to look like because, hey, let's face it, he's not from there. Um, so, <laughs> I know. Um, so, Salmanazar was questioned on this, and he responded that he was an aristocrat in Formosa. Uh, and uh, that the aristocracy lived underground. Uh, and therefore, he never got any sun and was pale, unlike the common folk of Formosa. Come on, man. Um, so here's the thing, too. When Salmanazar committed to a weird fact about Formosa, he was ride or die with that fact. As he put it, there was one maxim which I could never be propelled upon, prevailed upon to depart from, that whatever I had once affirmed in conversation, though to ever so few people, and though ever so improbable or even absurd, should never be amended or contradicted. So he stuck with it. When he said he was pale because rich folks lived underground, that was it, man. They did. Um, and <laughs> this is a lot to keep up with, though. And he was encouraged to write a book about the land of Formosa. So a short while after arriving in London, he published a historical and geographical description of Formosa, a full guide to the histories, customs, and language of his claimed native land. Uh, now, this book was a huge smash. The wild descriptions of Formosa sent books flying off the shelves. As soon as the first edition came out, there was already call for a second edition to meet the demand of the first edition. Um, now, much like the underground bourgeoisie and crooked chimneys, so much of Salmanazar's version of Formosa is just so strange and unnecessarily creative that I'd be remiss not to mention a few of the more downright uh, exciting and bizarre customs he created. So the upper echelons of society would cut off the heads of snakes and drink their blood for breakfast. Uh, it's pretty fucking metal. Um, <laughs> yeah, during a festival, they would sacrifice someone, drain them of their blood, boil their flesh in said blood, and everyone would eat a piece. Kind of like a communion that's a little too literal. Um, a common method of execution was for the offender to be hung upside down and shot with arrows. Uh, yeah. And seriously, no, cannibalism came up a lot. It drove the crowds wild. Um, and in fact, all that cannibalism talk was partly inspiration for Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Oh. There's also some great illustrations, such as this, um, such as this gentle, yeah. um, such as this gentleman's balcony. But this top heavy boat that would probably capsize immediately is merely for a gentleman. The king gets three stories of bo 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 bo. Um, uh, <laughs> I also love the men's fashion. As Salmanazar described it, they walk in a long gown with naked breast and thighs, but their privy parts are covered with a plate tied around them made of brass or silver or gold. Um, or if you're the, uh, the country bumpkin on the right, the plate to cover your junk is made of brass, the shells of fish, or the bark of trees. Uh, sounds really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and look, we can't talk about the customs of Formosa without talking about the annual sacrifices of children. <laughs> when I say Salmanazar was unnecessarily creative, this is the kind of shit I'm talking about. Rather than keeping it simple and claiming the people of the For um, the uh, the people of Formosa worship natural phenomenon like the sun and the moon and the stars, they instead used to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, and now worship a uh, single god that demands that they sacrifice eighteen thousand boys under the age of nine every year. Right? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what you see up here is an illustration of the tabernacle where the sacrifices would take place. So, they round up the kids, cut out their hearts, and throw them in a bowl in the center. Um, after, after they loaded up that bad boy with all 18,000 hearts, they'd burn them. 
uh, satisfying their god until the next year. Now, how did they maintain the population to do this? Well, as I mentioned, they only sacrificed boys. So any young lads that actually made it to adulthood would have multiple wives and many children to meet the demands of this god. Look, everything we've talked about so far is crazy. It's madness. Um, but there's one thing that helped lend credence to Salmanazar's wildest claims, because plot twist, he was a genius. Um, I know. His impressive memory helped to keep his story straight, but Salmanazar's true talent lie was language. And the language he created is one of the finest fake languages ever created. As, I met, as one article I read described the language, there was no, this was no mere farrago of whimsical nonsense improvised on the spur of the moment, but the product of systemic construction. Uh, woo. Uh, so when it came to the language of Formosa, there was a plan. All those weird customs, that's to please the crowd. Generate headlines. The heart of his claim lived in the language. In fact, Salmanazar had been developing and using his Formosan language well before his book on Formosa was published. Here's the Formosan alphabet, um, with the arrow pointing to the columns with the letters. Um, this is one of the few things we have left that includes the letters of this fake language. Now, um, there was a full translation of a church catechism commissioned by the Bishop of London, but sadly, it's lost to history. Um, descriptions of Formosa does contain some translations. For example, here are some of the Ten Commandments the fun ones. Um, the sentence structure was designed to match up with Latin to a degree. You can see that in how the word order more or, mess, more or less matches up with the English version of the, of the commandment. Um, this is also the, the most notable in that last one in the slide. Um, the language was designed to be read right to left, matching other Asian languages. It also contained a tonal element, which was lifted from descriptions of China from explorers of the time. In, the case of the, uh, in this case of the Formosan language, it was designed to indicate tense. Um, he also set up the language to be built from various root words. Uh, then by adding suffixes or prefixes, create words related to the root word. For example, all the words that you see above are built from that root word of bagne to lead uh, for various titles of leaders. This language was meticulous. Um, now, by modern standards, it's pretty easy to tell this language is a fake. Um, it's a little too regular. It doesn't contain the oddities and, quirk, oddities and quirks that a language that evolved naturally would have. Um, and, but for the time, it worked. And it worked great. But despite all of his cleverness and willingness to push his claims to the extreme, there was one problem Salmanazar couldn't solve. People's attention span. Millennials, right? Um, <laughs> uh, his popularity started to wane. People moved on after they had enough of the stories of the man of Formosa. So in time, Samanazar took up a career writing semi-anonymously on Grub Street, a place in 17th and 18th century London that was home to hack writers, poets, or one source I saw described as threadbare men of letters. Um, along with ghostwriting, writing entries for encyclopedias, and other literary odd jobs, Salmanazar um, became a somewhat respected expert on Hebrew. Not too much of a surprise, given his uh, knack for languages. Um, the closest we came to an admission, his Formosan ancestry was a hoax, was when he, talked with, uh, he was tasked with writing an encyclopedia entry on Formosa. In the entry was a note, written in the third person, that Salmanazar was a fraud, and the true details would be published after his death. The memoir I mentioned in the beginning. One other fun historical quirk is that during his time on Grub Street, Salmanazar befriended a young Samuel Johnson, famed dictionary writer and current internet meme. Uh, Samuel Johnson came to describe Salmanazar as the greatest man he had ever known. No joke. Yeah. So despite Salmanazar making his uh, life from a bold lies about a distant land, he found recognition and respect in being a true version of himself. So I'd like to leave you with a line Johnson would say about his fellow writers that worked on Grub Street. Hail Ithaca. After toil and bitter woe, I am glad to reach your soil. May you find your soil too. Thank you. All right. Everybody give it up for Aaron, first time speaker, finding his soil. And now, 
Why stop at just one first-time speaker? We have, please welcome.